Oregon's put together back-to-back top 10 recruiting classes. Do they have major needs in their recruiting cycle for 2025? I think just one. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked on Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening to or watching this show, which today is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Got my guy Max Torres. You can read him at Ducks Digest. Listen to and watch him over on the Ducks Dish podcast. Let's talk recruiting here at Max because that is where you are tapped in. And by the way, Max and I both ready for opening day, which is when we're recording the show. Uh, we got our teams repping had to do it of course because i love baseball uh and oregon baseball had a 5-4 come from, come from behind win on wednesday night so not half bad anyway max in 2025 i think the one glaring need for oregon to add depth is the offensive line you're gonna lose four starters from this year's team that are that are going to be among the first five that you know play up front you got cornelius will go to the nfl connerly probably to the nfl maybe he stays another year harper will be out of eligibility and then bedford will be out of eligibility so that's the one position where i look at and go if you can find a high level impact freshman in there it'd be great but you also need to start restacking the depth because of the number of guys you're about to lose offensive line is definitely a good position spencer for the ducks to hit on and, and focus on with a league terry here in the 2025 class uh, which is now down to only four commitments. But uh, Chavez Sandman Thompson, the O-lineman out of Florida, is one of those four guys. Um, so I think, yeah, great point about the offensive line. I think that's definitely a spot that the Ducks need to hit on, um, especially because you don't find a whole lot of offensive linemen that play right away. So you got to just get those guys into your program and, and get them developing and, and up to speed on uh, the college game. I think another spot I would bring into the discussion is safety. Um, just because the, the two guys that they have right now are, are both going to, the two projected starters, I should say, Kobe Savage and um, Taishim Johnson are going to be, um, you know, moving on after the 2024 season. So I think that you need to continue to build out the depth there. Um, and just, it seems like they haven't had a really, really top flight elite safety since Javon Holland. But Verone McKinley was I, I, really good too. Yeah, I was gonna say. I, I'd say. I mean, Verone McKinley led the country in interceptions. I think that's pretty top flight. But I'm I'm completely with you on that front. Like NFL caliber is kind of what I'm what I'm thinking. Okay, he, yeah. He is okay. playing in the NFL, I think, still. Um, so definitely. I mean, I'm a huge Verone fan. He was one of my favorite guys to interview. Yeah. Uh, when he was at Oregon, and but I'm he's not, you know, a Javon Holland type. Like he he pro. he'll he, he could bounce around teams maybe every now and then. But Ho- Holland is. Probably one of the best safeties Oregon had in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. So I think if you can continue to bring in elite, elite safeties, um, I think you're going to set yourself up for success. I've heard a really good early return on the pair that Oregon got from the high school ranks in 24. Uh, Aaron Flowers, I've gotten to see him myself, but I've heard a a lot of really good things about Kingston Lopa, um, just that he's kind of a freaky athlete. And um, I think that if you can have him maybe develop into like a Brian Addison 2.0 type of deal um, when he was a regular part of Oregon's defense, I think you're you're in for, uh, you know, good things. So O-line and safety, sign me up. Yeah, I, I think the, those are good positions to watch for. I also wonder about running back because Jordan James is entering his third year with the Ducks. He doesn't have a red shirt or a COVID year or anything like that. So he could come back for a senior season. I could also see him going to the NFL. I don't remember off the top of my head uh, whether or not Whittington could have another year. I don't think that he does. Max is going to look that up right now. But you look at the way that that position, you know, kind of plays for for the Ducks, and, and it's been very good over the last couple of decades. And Gary Campbell was a big part of that. Of course, Carlos Lachlan now is one of the most respected running back coaches and uh, recruiters at that position in the country. And you've got Jane Lamar and you've got Jay Harris and you've got uh, Dewan Riggs coming in, in in the 2024 cycle as well. 
I think if you were to lose both Whittington and James, you'd probably seek a portal option at that point, unless you really felt Jane Lamar was ready. But that's another one where if you lose two, two of your five scholarship guys, you're probably going to want to bring in a scholarship running back or two from the high school ranks for developmental purposes. Based on some of the conversations that I've been able to have, Spencer, I think the expectation is that the Ducks take another two running backs in the 2025 recruiting class. I think that uh, to, to answer your question, I believe Noah Whittington has two more years of eligibility left because the site says he was including a including this one. Yes. So okay. the, the the site says that he was a junior in 2023, but he utilized a red shirt. So in my mind, gets that back plus one more. But will he even need another year after that? I I, I don't know. Um, I think that's a, a good question to bring to the table because I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that Jordan James and Noah Whittington would both come back in 2025. Um, I almost feel like it's probably more realistic that you lose both of them just because I think that they're really, really talented guys and are going to have huge years in this offense. Yeah, I, I think that both have got NFL capabilities i don't think either is you know a, a second or third round running back which is kind of the highest most running backs are going to get drafted in the nfl nowadays and i'm curious to see where bucky irving gets selected but i think that you know they're, they're all different styles and types of runners and you got to see what kind of production they they can put out for the course of a year but you know i i i don't i think the most likely outcome with those two is that one comes back and one goes nfl because if one goes NFL, the other one knows, oh, well, I'm the number one back, right? Unless someone crazy good becomes available in the portal, you'd have to be really, really talented to be able to come in and just supersede either of those guys on, on the depth chart. But I, I want to go back to the offensive line for just a sec here, Max, because you know you think about the prospect of losing up to four guys from, from this year's unit. And you know last year, there was a true freshman who played. The year before, there was a true freshman who played along the offensive line. I think next year you, you look at a guy like Jaquan McCroy and certainly presume that's going to be someone that, that is a starting tackle or at least has that sort of potential for the Ducks in, in 2025. But, you know, you'll lock Poncho in probably at center uh, once again. But I don't know if McCroy is a left or, or right tackle. Um, what, what do you think about Oregon's chances uh, of getting, you know, one of the highly coveted tackles in the 2025 class? I think there's a chance we're, we're at a really important part of the recruiting calendar right now, Spencer, where it's been like so, so dead. That's why like I wasn't happy that necessarily that Adrian Wilson decommitted, but it gave me something to talk about, um, which was which was fun. And um, Oregon's in on a lot of really, really good tackles uh, early on in this class, whether it's Josh Petty out of the state of Georgia, Andrew Babalola out of a loaded state of Kansas this cycle. He's one of three guys that Oregon's pretty high on uh, out of the state this uh, this cycle, this time around. Michael Fasusi, also out of Texas. Aaron Dunn out of Utah. Spanish Fork, he's expected to be on campus, I believe, um, before too long, maybe for an official visit. So I think Oregon has a very good chance to get at least one uh, top-rated tackle in this class. And um, I think that you got to trust in the work that Elite Terry's done um, whether it's recruiting or developing, because he's been a absolutely massive success in Eugene, even though it's only been one year. But he's a guy who has a ton of familiarity with the program because he was a GA uh, under Mario Cristobal when when um, Marcus Harper, uh, one of the old linemen for this year's team, was was just kind of getting to Eugene. So I'm a huge Elite Terry fan, and I think he's going to continue to uh, acquire elite talent and put together great offensive lines. Yeah, Devin Brooks and Trent Ferguson are the two in-state offensive line prospects, both three-star guys that Oregon's got for the 2024 class. Fox Crater, uh, you know, was a guy that, you know, generated a little bit of buzz after committing to Oregon. There were rumors that LSU really wanted him, but he ended up staying committed to the Ducks. So there, there are some options there. I just think as you build it out, more guys graduate, you might have a couple guys transfer here and there. That, that that's something that, that Oregon has to have as, as a priority. And, you know, they've really loaded up with defensive players over the last couple of classes. It feels like defensive players and, and receivers. So I, I'm more than a little interested to see how this all shakes out. And it should start picking up in the coming weeks, especially after the spring game, which is time when you want to get guys to campus, have them on for a visit and give them a taste of, of that aughts and atmosphere and whatnot. But the wide receiver position is really loaded, but 
Could it get even more loaded come 2025? Max thinks the answer is yes. So we'll talk to him about that. After we talk, of course, by the spring cleaning champions at Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below the waist grooming. Clear out that winter brush with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com, use code locked on for 20% off plus free shipping. That's a pretty good elite tandem right there, like a great quarterback receiver condo. You get to tw- combo rather. You get 20% off and free shipping with that code locked on at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. They've got all sorts of products, everything you could possibly want or need. Nothing like a little spring cleaning. Go check out Manscaped. This episode also brought to you by our friends at Better Together. Let, let me just ask you something. Do you have a bracket that's busted, but you want to stay in the game? Better Together is a place for you. Introducing Better Together, the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs talent, and you can play with your friends, not against them. Pick more or less on real-time player stats, strategize with your partner to boost your odds, and climb the leaderboard together. So grab a friend and join the social DFS movement. I play golf with my friends all the time, and a lot of times we play matches against one another, but it'd be more fun and is more fun when you play together. That is why Better Together is where you should check out. Better Together is the first cooperative daily fantasy application provides a sense of camaraderie and enhances the social social experience of watching sports with your friends. Download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using promo code locked on for a chance to win your share of over $1000 in cash prizes. Play on a contest and use the code locked on because you get a chance to win $1000 in cash prizes. Winning alone is fun, but it's better together. All right, Max, let's hit some more receiver talk here. Yesterday, Brian Smith and I talked here on the show about the idea of adding DeCorey and more five-star wide receiver who's currently committed to LSU. Texas is going to recruit him hard. That's going to be difficult, though not impossible, for for the Ducks and Junior Adams uh, and the rest of that offensive staff. But you've got some other names on your radar with the Adrian Wilson decommitment that you feel like could, you know, once again, deliver a strong wide receiver recruiting class for the Ducks because 2024s, what was really quite excellent. 2024s was insane, Spencer. And I think what made that so fun to watch and to cover was how quickly it came together at the very end with Ryan Pelham flipping from USC and Jeremiah McClellan flipping from Ohio State. And then Junior Adams, just while he was there, he's like, oh, I might as well add Gatlin Berry, you know, whatever, another another five-star wideout um, with blazing speed. So he, he certainly knows what he's doing when it comes to recruiting the position and then developing it with a guy like Troy Franklin set to go in this year's draft. So some other names to watch in the 2025 class at wideout. I think two are kind of at the forefront for me. And then you have a couple of other ones that are, um, you know, firmly on Oregon's board, but maybe don't know quite as much about them or just where they ultimately lie. I think the first one that I want to talk about is Cooper Perry out of Scottsdale, Arizona, Notre Dame prep. He's a wide receiver that has been very closely linked to the Ducks for a long time. He has two trips lined up to get back to Eugene in the month of April, and then he's going to take his official visit in June. So um, when you're looking at Cooper Perry and his recruitment, I think he's saying all the right things, but he's also doing all the right things when it comes to getting back to campus. And um, I think just being a guy who always has great things to say about Oregon. Two other schools to watch there. I think you really have to look at Arizona State. Kenny Dillingham and the Sun Devils are really doing what they can to kind of go all out when it comes to keeping some of these top players in state. And um, it seems like they're trying to get, you know, their athletic department together and kind of get things on board, activate the Valley as he always is putting out there on social media. So Cooper Perry is a big one. And then the other one that I was talking to you about is Isaiah Mosey out of Lee Summit, Missouri, really, really talented guy, great playmaker, got a lot of twitch ball skills, yards after the catch i mean you name it i think this guy can do it um he's someone that i think oregon could have an inside track on seeing that he um his dad i should say coached with dan lanning before dan lanning became uh the big shot head coach that he is today running things at oregon and i think even more so with that i think dan lanning recruiting his home state just takes on a little bit more meaning but i think that cooper perry and isaiah mosey are the two big names that you want to watch at wideout for oregon moving forward. I got some more, but I'll, I'll let you 
say your piece? Yeah, I, I think Arizona and, and Missouri are a couple of states that have really started to increase the the volume of blue chip prospects that they've churned out year after year. And I think Oregon's done a very good job recruiting those particular states. You know, they weren't able to get Williams Nuneri, the number one defensive tackle who went to Missouri and Eli Drinkowitz, but Oregon was very much in the mix there. And Lanning has, you know, got some guys on uh, on staff, one or two, I think, that have ties to that state beyond just himself. And so I, I think that, you know, being able to go out there is a testament to where Oregon is at in the recruiting sense, and they're in a very good spot. But th- there was a photo, correct me if I'm wrong, of Cooper Perry and Luke Moga, who is Oregon's true freshman quarterback in the 2024 cycle. What, what if anything, should Oregon fans make of that, do you think? I don't think there's that much to make that isn't already out there. Um, I mean, they're they're really, really good friends. Um, you know, Moga and the rest of the football team, they're back home on spring break right now before practice gets rolling and, you know, pedal to the metal next month. So uh, I think it's just another good development. I know that Moga is someone that uh, would love to to have one of his buddies um, continue that Desert Ducks movement from Arizona to Eugene. Um, Cooper is playing lacrosse right now, so he's just a really gifted athlete that is – you love – I love it when Oregon recruits guys that play multiple sports because it just makes them more fun to cover. And, um, you know, the upside is, is, is that much higher. So um, I think that that's a positive development for Oregon. Um, you know, you just got to keep, uh, keep, keep on keeping on and uh, keep getting these big time recruits to campus. I think that with spring practice starting next week, um, I think it's going to make these visits that much more impactful Spencer, because, you can come on a visit during the off season and, you know, see the facilities and this, that, and the third, see Eugene. But I think that when these, co- when these players are actually able to see these coaches in their element, doing their thing, like, Oh, that's what I'm getting myself into. If I come here, I think that is, uh, is invaluable. So not only are Dan letting the ducks trying to make the absolute most of these remaining 13 spring practices on the field with their team, they're trying to get everything they can out of the recruiting potential as well. Yeah, and all eyes, of course, are on that spring game on April 27th. We're less than a month away from that. Now, the next time I bring you all an episode of Locked on Ducks, it will be the same month as when the spring game occurs. Tragically, I will not be able to attend. Are you going to go to the spring game, Max? Yeah, Max will be there. So if you're going to go to the game, which you absolutely should, because as we've talked about, there's recruiting value there. And, you know, being able to put 30,000, 40,000 people in the stands – does not hurt to give people, you know, or to give kids a sense of, you know, what it's like to play at Oregon, be at Oregon and feel the energy and and everything like that. But make sure you check out Max uh, at that game if you're planning to go. But uh, there, there are plenty of answers, I think, for this Oregon team going into that spring game. But I think there are some questions as well. What, what are kind of your two big picture questions as Oregon, you know, gets back into spring football next week and, you know, uh, builds up to that spring game? Ooh, um, so this is just anywhere on the team. I was any, like any, the, any, anywhere the on the team. Your like, two big okay. questions. You can have a question about a kick returner, quarterback, running back, defensive line, wherever you like. I think um, my first one, just to kind of, is a big picture one, I guess, but on some specific guys, just how do Evan Stewart and Jabbar Muhammad look? Um, those are two guys that weren't in Eugene at the start of spring practice, but because Oregon's on the quarter system, it looks like they'll be joining the team once things resume here in April. And those are, I'd say those are probably the two highest transfers that, that the Ducks got or two of the highly, two of the most highly anticipated guys that fans are just, you know, I want to hear something about these guys. Um, so I think that Evan Stewart obviously is incredibly gifted at the wide receiver spot and just injects that room with a whole lot more talent. And to think that he's going to be able to push the corners that much more as well. Like we could be getting that good on good Jabari Muhammad versus Evan Stewart. Like that just sounds like a story in and of itself. Um, but uh, Jabari Muhammad comes over from Washington. I think he kind of slots in as your pretty clear cut CB one. Um, so I want to see how things kind of shake out behind him. So how do those two guys look is my first question. Um, and then I guess staying on defense, I'm just more interested to see how the cornerback room shakes out because that is um, one with so, so much talent, maybe too much talent. I um, mean, you can only put so many guys on the field at once, Spencer, but I'd say those are my two big questions now as we eye this return. And we're going to dive deeper into those questions with Max. 
After we dive into Nissan with this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight, brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. The North Carolina Tar Heels are the Nissan Armada. This one seed is as hardcore as it gets, and it's no wonder they've secured a spot in the Sweet 16 against Alabama, which has already taken place by the time you're listening to or watching this show. I think North Carolina wins. We'll see if I'm right. Iowa State, they play Illinois in the Sweet 16. They are the Nissan Pathfinder. They've created a lane for themselves, and they are one of the hottest teams in the country coming into this tournament. We'll see if they can get it going again. We'll just know after the fact, or you will know. I will not know yet, but later tonight I will, of course. The NC State Wolfpack are this week's Nissan Rogue. The team absolutely surprised us all with a powerful performance in their first two games in the tournament. Wins over Texas Tech and Oakland have set them up to play Marquette. I'm excited to watch it all, and you should be excited about the opportunity to go check out Nissan. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure. Shop at NissanUSA.com. All right, Max, so I, I like where you started with the two big transfers and weren't even mentioning Dylan Gabriel in there. And, you know, as, as you and I were joking about over text, we don't work for ESPN, so we're not going to pretend there's a quarterback battle here. Is uh, there? Hey, man. <laughs> sometimes when you know more, you don't know very much. But I think that for for Oregon to bring in Stewart and, and Muhammad, yeah, the battles in practice can be great, but – they also need to produce at a high level going into next year because you lose Troy Franklin, you lose Kyrie Jackson. Those are your wide receiver ones and cornerback ones from a, a year ago. And I think this is using the transfer portal at its best. If you're the Ducks, you bring in two guys who are proven starters at the Power 5 level and you anticipate to come in and, and have the chance to you know be high caliber, all-conference caliber guys. That's definitely the expectation, I think, for, for both of them. Um, yeah, and I didn't talk about Gabriel just because, oh, he was already there, but um, yeah, the first two practices. But, right. but yeah, I think, I think the expectations are obviously very high for both of them. And I think the good thing for Oregon is that you have a lot of players. Some of them have, have just gotten there. Some of them have been there for a minute that they're not necessarily just going to, what do you think? Like they come in and like, oh, man, like there goes my job. Like they're going to keep pushing those guys each and every day in, in practice. I don't think anything's given. That's certainly uh, what the case has been under Dan Lanning. Just competition uh, breeds excellence. And I think that we're going to see that in a big way throughout the spring. I mean, I don't think we're necessarily going to see it um, in person because, you know, we just don't get a whole lot of access. So maybe it'll be the spring game or even that first game against Idaho when we actually get to see it. But th these are those important months where you you instill the culture, uh, you enforce the standard, you get everyone to live up to that standard, and um, you just kind of got to build your team to hopefully, you know, get to that point that you want once the the year starts. So, kind of had a little bit of brain fart there, but we're navigating it. <laughs> um, and I think that uh, there's just so much talent in, at both of those positions that the the potential is just so so intriguing. I think that the cornerback potential is is more intriguing, I would say, than the receiver potential, just because you have some more known commodities at receiver. Um, and Will Stein has just been an absolute genie uh, drawing up these offenses. So I think that corner, maybe I'll put it this way: corner needs to take a bigger step forward this year than the wide receiver room. I think that's where I would probably put it. Yeah, I think I agree. And you, you have, you know, three or four leading wideouts from a year ago, plus your other leading receiver and Terrence Ferguson at tight end. I think that receiver room is very set and they're one of the best in the country. The corner room, I, I fully expect Muhammad to be cornerback one. And I fully expect Kobe Savage to start at safety. I don't know that any other defensive back position is 100% set. Like, Tysheem Johnson did some nice things last year, but he played a lot of nickel. And they brought in Brandon Johnson from Duke, who was also a two-time, or I guess, you know, Tysheem was honorable mention once in the Pac-12 last year, but he was two-time ACC honorable mention over there. I don't think that he was brought in to, you know, just serve in a reserve role. I, I think the secondary is just such a fascinating room because you've got this, this high mix of, like, everybody. There, there are three categories of players. You're either a returner, you are a new high school kid, or you're a transfer. And you've got all of that in in this in this defensive back room because you've got 
like Roderick Pleasant and Dalen Austin, for instance, highly touted 2023 recruits. Are they just not going to be able to see the field this year? You bring in transfers like Jabbar Muhammad. You bring in Cam Alexander from UTSA, who was All-American Conference over there. So I think there are just so many guys. And then you've got returners like Ty Sheem and Dante Manning and Nico Reed as well. I think this is one of the biggest questions and, and something that when the spring game rolls around on April 27th, I'm going to be highly, highly dialed in to who plays well, who stands out, and who's playing who's playing where and whatnot, because I think there are a lot of different ways it can go. And I think the competition hopefully does breed uh, the, the excellence for the secondary because you know it was it was very good last year for the most part, but could still still could have been better. I like that you mentioned Nico Reed Spencer. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to bring something to the table here with him. I think um, it's early in the spring, obviously, but it was something that kind of caught my attention in one of my recent conversations, talking with someone close to the program. Um, It sounds like Nico Reed's kind of making some noise in in spring ball, um, which I think is interesting because, um, you know, I, I don't feel like he's somebody that I've talked about very much. And I think he's somebody that is probably getting, um, I, was, I don't know what the word I would say, like, you know, just overlooked, kind of swept over, under the rug. Yeah. in in this conversation for Oregon secondary going into 2024. And, and he's someone that obviously had an interesting journey to Oregon, started at Colorado. Uh, but Demetrius Martin knew him super well. And then he, ha- he got him out of the portal to come over to Oregon. Didn't have a huge year with the ducks, but I think did carve out, I'd say at least a decent role. You know, it's not like we never saw the guy. Yeah. I, um, I mean, I, I definitely would classify his role as a starting role. It's not like one of the high end starters, maybe not top of the depth chart, but when I think about starters, you know, I I'm also kind of putting into the mix high level rotation players. If you'd rather refer to it that in, in that way and get semantical with it, I, I think that that, it is what Nico Reed definitely was. And then when injuries occurred, you know, there were times when both Florence and Jackson were hurt. Nico Reed was one of the two starters on on the outside at times. Yeah. And we saw a bunch of him in the Pac-12 title game. Um, and we had, I think he had one of those big sacks uh, against Penix. He had the sack starts. on uh, on fourth down after the Bo Nix interception. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think after that happened, like we were just freaking out in the press box. Like, wow, I feel like that completely neutralized um, the, the interception. So, um, yeah, Reed, I think tends to get overlooked when you're looking at the corners, but I think it also kind of makes sense to a degree just because of the guys that they brought in Jabbar Muhammad, Cam Alexander. Um, but you also have to look at this Sioni Laulea, Dakota Fields, Ifeo Bidegwu. There, there's so many guys in that room, Roderick Pleasant, Dalen Austin, and what, what, what's their year one to year two leap ultimately look like. So, I think it's a good development, especially because I think you can have him for two more seasons after this year because he was a young guy when he committed to Oregon. He spent only one season at Colorado. So keep an eye out on Nico Reed. Um, I'm not saying I'm expecting huge things necessarily, but just wanted to kind of drop that little nugget out there. Um, and I'm excited to see what he can do along with those uh, young guys, Dakota Fields and Ifeo Badegu as well, and Sione Laulea, the, the Juco guy. Yeah, so uh, his freshman year was uh, 2021 at Colorado. So this will be his last year of college football, Nico Reed. But, you know, what? one thing that I have thought about on more than one occasion with the secondary and the questions, is someone going to change positions? Because how many corners do you have versus how many safeties do you have? Like, let, let's just list every every corner that Oregon has who is either – who is, who is either a returning rotation player or starter or a four-star recruit or transfer. You've got Jabbar Muhammad, Nico Reed, Jaleel Florence, Dante Manning, Cam Alexander, Brandon Johnson at nickel. Does that count as a corner? I mean, doesn't play on the outside. I think that's more of a safety to, yeah. uh, to me. But then you have Roderick Pleasant. You have Dalen Austin. You have Ifeo Badegu. You have Dakota Fields coming in. That's not even every Alvin corner. Davis. Yeah, so, yeah you got guy. Solomon Davis, Colin Gill, you know, who are in the mix as well, former three-star guys. And, you know, stars are just stars at that point. Once once you get, like, if you're good enough, you're old enough and whatnot. But that's like 11 guys. That's, that's, that's like 11 guys. Whereas safety, you, you go Kobe Savage, you've got Taishim Johnson. I think Brandon Johnson is, you know, essentially a safety in there. Tyler Turner, Cody DeCambra, and, and, and uh, Aaron Flowers, the freshman. 
Kingston Lopa. Kingston I, Lopa. I, I think Colin isn't isn't Lopa kind of in between playing linebacker and safety? See, that's kind of what some of the discussion was um, coming out of signing day. But Landon got asked about him, and they say they see him more as a hybrid safety, like more of a. So I think Brian Addison 2.0 is kind of what they're hoping for from Which him. Which I'm here I, for. I he starts. I, yeah, I'm totally here for it. When he was when he was you know around and had a big role, um, he was arguably their most productive safety. Um, so I think that getting something out of Lopa would be great. Um, and then Colin Gill is another guy that I think people, a lot of people have forgotten about. I'm not saying I expect him to make a lot of noise necessarily, but they have options. It's just a matter of some of these guys just need reps, Spencer. And that's why I think some but of these But it's just, it's going to be hard to get reps because when you bring in all those transfers, like Cam Alexander was all American conference selection last year. He's not coming to Oregon if he doesn't have some assumption or guarantee that, that he's going to play at least a little bit, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's generally how things go, especially this is his third school. So I think that, you know, he's going to be heavily involved there. Um, but I don't know. You got to see the cream rises to the top after uh, all this uh, competition in spring. And then fall camp is, is really where it's going to um, we're going to get some more clear answers heading into the season opener. Max Torres, read him at Ducks Digest. Listen to and watch him on the Ducks Dish podcast. Always a great time. Is there a better way to end the weekend? No, I, I, I think, or end the week and go into the weekend at rather. I think not. Max, thanks as always. Thanks for having me on, Spencer. Appreciate it. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, go Ducks.